pray with me? Father, we pray that this offering be used to uh, further your kingdom, save lost souls, Lord, and help our brothers and sisters all over the world. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for answering our prayers and for the privilege we have to be here every week and worship you, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray to you. Amen. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Good morning. Good morning. What a beautiful day. It's good to see everybody here today. Especially if you're visiting with us, we especially want to welcome you. We're glad you're here with us. A couple quick notes and reminders before we get into our subject for this morning. Uh, a reminder that camp is still in session and your window is closing. Uh, we're at Intermediate Week. Intermediate Week is the fourth week out of seven, which means we've got three weeks behind us, one going on, three weeks to come. And so if you've got a child Who's in great, who has finished grades one through seven, they still can get to a week at camp. And it's really important that they get to a week at camp. So please make that happen. If you need some help, let us know. We can, uh, we can provide some financial assistance, whatever it takes. We want your kids to get to camp. Note also that uh, there has been, for some time in the bulletin, note of uh, men's and boys' retreat coming up. That has been modified a little bit. The original plan has been altered. It's now sort of a camping and rafting trip. It's going to be August 17 and 18. The details are, the new details will be in the bulletin this week. You should know that Paul Florio and John Bonham are the point people for that. So make note of that. More info to come. And then lastly, just a reminder, uh, next weekend our worship leaders are going to be very busy. We have a seminar, uh, a guy coming in from Tennessee to work with our worship leaders. Very excited about that. They are very excited about that. And we will have a, a guest worship leader next Sunday. So uh, that's very exciting too. Not a guest preacher, sorry, uh, but a guest worship leader. All right, uh, I, don't, I don't know about you. I am sort of fascinated, sort of intrigued by um, urban legends, by some of the, the weird stuff that people believe. And we do believe some weird stuff. And our, an urban legend is, uh, it's a story, it's a rumor, it's a piece of information, an anecdote that at first when you hear it, it sounds unbelievable and you go, oh, that's crazy, that can't possibly be true. But over time, you start hearing it more, you start hearing it from other people. It gets credibility in various ways, in various places. It gets circulated as truth. And, and after a while, you start saying, well, you know, maybe that is true. And maybe you even get to the point where you start taking that thing that at first you didn't believe in, and you start, you know, spreading it around as truth. We do that sometimes. Urban legends usually come with some form of attribution. It's very important to try to give them an air of credibility, especially for the person, you know, who originally perhaps invented the story. They want to, they want to make it sound like it could be real. And so um, having some trusted figure involved uh, gives it that air of authenticity. And so very often it's fascinating to watch how these, how these travel over time. You'll hear a story that's told that's attributed to Abraham Lincoln. And then a few years later, you'll hear the exact same story, except this time it's John F. Kennedy. And then not long after that, the exact same story, but now Ronald Reagan is the hero. And not long after that, the exact same story, and it's Barack Obama. And so that's how these things happen. And over time, they become more and more familiar to more people, and more and more people come to believe that they're true. And so they circulate more and more widely, and after a while, they sort of take on a life of their own. There are all kinds of different kinds of uh, urban legends. There are some that I would classify as creepy urban legends. And uh, I don't know, probably all of you have heard the one about, about the person who goes to the hotel. They're at a conference. They go to the hotel bar. They meet a person at the bar. They have a few drinks. The next thing they know, they wake up and they're in their room, except they're in their bathtub and they're covered in ice. 
and there's a scar in their side and a note that says your organs have been harvested and you better call 911 or you're going to die. We've heard that one, haven't we? That one, that one a couple years ago made the rounds widely. That's a creepy one. Uh, how about this one, the one about uh, crocodiles in New York City? Yeah, the, the legend goes that, you know, back 100 years ago, uh, exotic animals were being imported and, and people just didn't know what to do with them. After a while, they'd just flush them down the toilet or they'd throw them in the sewer. And so now, if you go to New York, you've got to be careful because there's this whole colony of crocodiles that live in the sewers. And so be very careful as you step over sewer grates or, or openings. When you're walking around Manhattan, you never know, your leg might get bit off by a croc. Or how about the one, you know, that says that, uh, it's a very scientific looking study that says that, uh, that the average human being over the course of the average year will, while they are sleeping, swallow eight spiders. You've heard that one, right? I'm not putting that picture up there. That is too terrifying to, to see visually, although if you Google, do a Google search, you'll find images of that. I, I, I'm not going to do that. But those are the creepy ones. Then there are the food legends. I find these fascinating as well, that, that somehow somebody started the rumor that if you take a human tooth and you take a, a glass of Coca-Cola and you drop the tooth in the glass of Coca-Cola and you let it sit there overnight in the morning when you get up, that tooth will be gone. It will have dissolved in the Coca-Cola. Or how about this one? I love this one, that, uh, that in fact, Kentucky Fried Chicken is not allowed to be called Kentucky Fried Chicken anymore. They had to change their name to KFC. Why? Because, well, the government found out that they're not actually serving you chickens. That at some point, they developed this hybrid kind of form of poultry uh, that has eight legs and, and no, no head, and that that's what they raise, and that that's what they serve you when you go to Kentucky Fried Chicken. That has certainly made the rounds over the years. Yeah, hey, you think I'm making this stuff up? That would be funny. I, I could probably throw some made, homemade ones in here and see if anybody noted the difference. Uh, famous people often find themselves mentioned in urban legends. And again, I think it's because of that air of authenticity, that credibility. Did you know, for instance, that Mr. Rogers was a Navy SEAL? Or maybe a Marine sniper in Vietnam. It depends on what source you go to, but the sweater, of course, is to cover up all his tattoos, right? That's why, he, that's why he wears the sweater. Did you know that Walt Disney was frozen cryogenically when he died in 1966? Did you know also in 1966 that Paul McCartney actually died and was thereby replaced by a look-alike and presumably a sound-alike on the Beatles? Did you know? And then, of course, they're the ones that somehow just seem extra ridiculous, and yet over time, they gain credibility. I was fascinated to learn that there is actually a city in Japan, a uh, manufacturing center, that uh, shortly after World War II, they were trying to figure out how to boost exports, boost manufacturing, and so they renamed their city USA. Now, I don't know how it's pronounced in, in Japanese, but they did that so that now they could put a label on all their stuff that they manufacture that says made in, well, they would say USA, but we would say made in USA. Oh, man, it's really made in Japan. But how would we know? Or, or how about this one? That on the next census, that if enough people, when they get to the religion section, if enough people will write in under your religion, if you'll write in Jedi, well, the government will be forced to recognize Jedi as an official American religion. So that's all you have to do. We just have to get a bunch of people to do that. And I tell you this, right, reminding you, next year is a census year. So, you know, if we get enough people, you want to give this a try. And of course, there is, uh, there's the Loch Ness Monster, right? There's the Bigfoot, there's the Chupacabra, too terrifying to even put a picture up there. I have some great memories of urban legends spread at camp. I hope it's still going on at camp. I hope people are spreading. I hope that the stories about the Manitani Claw are being told this week. I've had a lot of fun over the years telling that story. Although I have to say that over the years, the last time I told that story, I was uh, 16 years old and I was counseling a group of first and second graders. And we had a very elaborate uh, presentation of that story, which is another story in its own, on its own. It was spectacular. We got those kids so good. Uh, and then they wet the bed all night and none of them slept and uh, we didn't sleep. And so, uh, you know, I learned my lesson there. I think probably some people would say that was justice. But, you know, I'm confident that there is some variation of the claw story that's told in every summer camp in America. It's just one of those things. It makes the rounds. And that's what happens with urban legends and especially in what we call the Internet age. They spread, they grow, they adapt to culture, they adapt to current events, they adapt to technology, they take on a life of their own. 
I have to say, you know, most of the time as you read these things, they're worth a chuckle. Urban legends are, are mostly probably harmless. They're kind of fun. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I don't know how worked up we want to get about them in general. I, I know that most of us don't want to be the kinds of people who are easily deceived. So there's probably that. Do we really just want to blindly follow or listen to or say is true every kind of thing that comes down the path? And I know that as Christians, I think we have a particular charge here because God is a God of truth and we are God's people. And so we want to be people who value truth. And so we have to be particularly careful. I think uh, one of the things that I see more and more among Christians is a willingness to to sometimes uh, pass on things that they probably know are lies, but but they kind of like what they're lying about. And so I see this typically a lot of times in the elections. I get stuff, I get emails forwarded from people who are Christians that you know are not true, They've been, things have been proven not to be true, but, but it's something against somebody that they don't like politically. And so they think, well, that's okay, I'm just gonna pass this along. That's not good. We're Christians, we're supposed to be people who, who, uh, who live in this world in a way that, that magnifies and glorifies God. And, and we're supposed to be people that when people look at us, they would say, oh, that person kind of resembles Jesus, and I think when we get caught up in stuff like this, uh, that's that's you know, as Christians, we shouldn't be spreading rumors. We shouldn't be a part of perpetuating untruth. But most of these things probably just don't do a whole lot of damage, I would say. What's not so harmless is a different type of urban legend. These are things that are not on, that people think are not only true, but things that people actually believe come from the Bible, and yet they don't. And this is a problem. Now, as I mentioned last week, uh, just in a brief preview of this series, uh, some of these are probably more pernicious than others. And so these are, there are a couple things uh, that you could say. Maybe you have uh, perpetuated these phrases, and, and as you have said them, you've said somewhere, well, you know, it says in the Bible, cleanliness is next to godliness or whatever. And on and on down the line, you could go, none of these are, you should know if you didn't, none of these are actually in the Bible. Um, and yet they, you know, they kind of maybe reflect some ideas or some values that we would say are biblical. And so, okay, you know, I, I don't know. The one about cleanliness is probably out there, uh, probably essentially harmless. I tend to think that probably if we ask God, God, would you prefer that his people be clean, that your people be clean or that they be filthy? God would probably say clean, but I don't know. And it doesn't really take a hard stand on that in the word of God. And of course, it's not, it's not really a surprise if you really step back and think about it. It's not really a surprise that sometimes the Bible might get misquoted. It is far and away the most quoted book that has ever been written. Uh, most copies exist. Most, the most people have an interest in quoting it and perpetuating it. And of course, there are all those different translations and they don't all read the same. And so sometimes you get an idea in your head and, and as you're trying to quote it without having it there in front of you, maybe you say it in a way that's not correct. I mean, we can imagine those things happening, but there is a whole collection, a whole collection of what, for the purposes of this study, we're gonna label as Christian urban legends that are downright, I would say, dangerous, spiritually harmful, things that, that cannot be allowed, ideas that cannot be allowed to perpetuate among God's people. It just can't be allowed to happen because you know, there's a whole lot of things going on here that are dangerous. These are things that affect our worldview. And after a while, if we get enough things in our worldview that are not of, of God, then all of a sudden, maybe we don't have a godly worldview anymore. And so that, that ought to concern us. These are things that, that skew our very ideas about God and who he is and, and what he does in our world. And that, down the line, affects our relationship with him and it affects how we show him to the world in which we live. Christian urban legends. Christian urban legends have potentially tragic spiritual ramifications. And so we need to try to get these ideas corrected. We need to try to get these things right. As Christians, I think probably we would all agree on some level that, uh, that we should care about getting it right when it comes to the word of God. This is a principle that we see exhibited some very specific teaching in the Bible about this. Uh, a lot of well-known passages that remind us of this. And so uh, I would take you, uh, I think there's a couple in, in, second, in second Timothy. Second Timothy chapter two, verse 15 uh, is a, a, a reminder there that as followers of God, we are to correctly handle the word of truth. That, that there's a right way and a wrong way to handle God's word. We should strive to handle it the right way. And later on uh, in chapter three, we're reminded that, uh, that all scripture is God-breathed. 
That's a powerful statement right there. Scripture comes from God. It is God's word. It is God speaking to us. That ought to be a very serious thing that we have in our heads whenever we are looking at the word of God and whenever we're trying to understand it and apply it to our lives. God's word has the power to help us to grow and to mature in our faith. And so uh, we will, there's a right way to do that and there's a wrong way to do that. And, and of course, we're reminded, as Bill often reminds us, about the Bereans. In Acts chapter 17, the Bereans are famously commended for the way that they handle scripture. And, and the thing that they were doing that is so powerful is people would come and they would, they would present ideas. And a lot of times those ideas that they were presenting came from culture. And so what the Bereans would do is they would listen to those ideas and then they would take up the word of God and they would compare the ideas of culture to what God was saying and they would say, okay, based on what you're saying, it's, it's either true or not true because here's what God says about it. That's a beautiful thing. That's a powerful thing. And they even did this when Paul was speaking. Think about that. They did it for everybody. Personally, I love something that Jesus said that I think fits in with this this morning. Uh, something Jesus said that actually links God's people across space and time. And if you've got your Bibles and you want to just be reminded of this, or flip to this, we're not going to spend any time in any, in any of these texts this morning. You know, I usually don't throw so many texts at you in one morning, but just as we're building this case for why we need to be doing this, why we're taking up this subject. Jesus in Matthew chapter four, you know the story. Jesus has gone out into the wilderness. He's getting ready to start his new ministry. And he has spent 40 days out there in the wilderness and he hasn't had anything to eat. And so you can imagine at this point when he comes home, when he comes back from, from this experience, he's weak, he's vulnerable. And of course, as we know, we know how Satan works and that's when Satan approaches him. And Satan comes at him with some very specific uh, temptations. One of the things that we hang on to as we take the Lord's Supper every week is this idea, this notion from Scripture that, that Jesus was a human being. And this is one of the places we see it most clearly. Satan comes to him when he's vulnerable. And he looks at him, a guy who hasn't eaten anything in 40 days, and he says, hey, there's a lot of rocks here. If you're the son of God, why don't you just take a rock or two and make them into loaves of bread? And then, you know, eat a little snack, have a little dinner, and then we can talk more. That's kind of what he does there, Matthew chapter four. And Jesus says, and I love how he, how he starts it, he says, it is written. It is written. Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is Jesus, a, a very hungry Jesus with, yeah, an unlimited supply of rocks that could have instantly become bread, that this is Jesus instead telling Satan something about the word of God. Quoting here from Deuteronomy chapter eight, it is written. This is God's word. Deuteronomy, if you wanna just flip back there, I think it's powerful as we understand uh, how God has been working from the beginning till now and how he will continue to work for all eternity in the lives of his people and how we see the connection between us and God's people who've gone on before, God's people of his original covenant. Deuteronomy is at the end of the, what's called the Pentateuch. It is the books of the law in the Old Testament, the first five books of the Old Testament. It is the only book in the Old Testament that Jesus quotes, uh, let me say that again, there's only one book in the New Testament that Jesus quotes more than Deuteronomy. And that's the book of Psalms. Jesus loves Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is important to him. He has a lot to say about it. And in Deuteronomy, this text that Jesus is quoting there in Matthew chapter four, Deuteronomy chapter eight, uh, God is recording here the end of an era. Deuteronomy is the end of one incredible period of, of, his, of the history of his people and the beginning of a new period. It is the end of Moses' time leading God's people. It is the transition to their new leader, Joshua, who will lead them into the promised land. And they're getting ready to enter the promised land, but Moses will not be joining them. And so he has some things that, that he wants to say, some things God wants him to say that are incredibly important that he wants to pass on to the people before this legendary leader, this great spiritual leader, dies. And that's what's gonna happen. And so in Deuteronomy chapter eight, Moses recounts again the story of God's blessing of his people and how he's taking care of them. He talks about how he has delivered them from slavery in Egypt, how they were there for 400 years and God got them out. And he talks about how they wandered around for 40 years in the desert and there was no food in the desert, but God fed them for 40 years with manna from heaven and with quail. God did that and he talks about how he brought them here to this point that they're at when Moses is talking to them right on the edge of the Jordan River as they get ready to enter their homeland. And it's in the middle of all that that he tells them that their physical hunger in the wilderness, think about this, 
was actually a teachable moment. The, the growling in their stomach because they didn't have food or didn't have enough food was to remind them that there was something that they actually needed more than food. And what they needed was God's word. Constantly, consistently. Man shall not live on bread alone, but in every word that comes from the mouth of God. Moses' word to God's people 1,300 years before Jesus will echo those same words as he experiences physical hunger on the edge of his own wilderness. God's word brings life. God's word brings sustenance. We want to know God as he actually is, and we want to know God's word as it actually is. We have nothing that can improve on either one of those things. And so we want to, we want to get it right. However, as long as we're here, a word, of, a word of caution. A word of caution as we think about this idea of God's word and getting it right. A word of caution about thinking that we will ever be able somehow to perfectly understand everything in God's word. That somehow we'll ever be able to perfectly apply the word of God. That somehow it'll be possible if we just work hard enough. That somehow it'll be possible if we just study long enough that if we can do that, we'll get everything right at some point. A word of caution. We have not ever done that. We are not currently doing that. We will never be able to do that. We can't do that. We're never going to get it perfect. We're never going to know everything. We're never going to understand everything. We're never going to apply everything perfectly. And part of the good news is that eternally speaking, we don't have to. Eternally speaking, we don't have to. As is true in every other area of our relationship with God, he is gracious. Hold on to that one. He is merciful. Hold on to that one. But this is really not about our trying to be perfect. That's not why we want to get it right. This is about honoring the one who is perfect. Honoring God's word is one of the most significant ways in which we honor God. Taking seriously what he says is one of the most significant ways in which we show respect for who he is. Putting God's word above our own wisdom and above the wisdom of the current age or the current culture in which we exist, and above our own desires and our own, wis our own wishes, this is one way that we affirm the proper order of things. That God is God and we are not. And that what God says, what God speaks, is something to be listened to. And that we desire to think and to live according to his ways and not our own. One of the books I've been reading lately, I, the author was talking about a couple of things and he was talking about this idea of understanding God and he, he threw out this quote, I thought it was interesting, I thought I, would, I thought I would share it with you this morning. He said, God will not change the way he feels about you even if you believe wrong things about him. I think that's biblically accurate and also I'm thankful for that. But he goes on to say, and I think this is a worthwhile point as well, but if you believe wrong things about God, it will certainly change the way you feel about him. And I would add, it will certainly change the way you live your life. We don't want to believe wrong things about God or about God's word. Because there is so much that God does not reveal to us about himself, he chooses not to reveal about himself, it's probably inevitable that every one of us in our desire to know him will choose to believe some things that in the final analysis we will discover are actually not true. We, we tried to get accurate information. We tried to get it from God. We did the best we could. We, we chose to believe some things that turned out to be erroneous, but choosing to believe, choosing to believe wrong things about God when truth has been revealed to us in his word certainly does not honor him. And I would suggest it shows a lack of love for him. And so this series... Uh, in this series, we will attempt to humbly realign our thinking. If we need to, some, some of these things that we're going to talk about, you may discover, no, I, I'm, where, where I'm at is where the Bible's at. That's great. I would love it if we get to the end and we would all go, well, you sort of wasted our time for two months because we were all just tracking right with the Bible. I hope, I hope that happens. I don't think that's going to happen, but I hope it happens. And that's what we're going to try to do here, to realign our thinking with God's revelation, with his holy scripture. 
And so here, let me just give you a preview. Here are some of the Christian urban legends that I think we're going to be talking about over the course of probably the next two months or so, give or take. I'm going to give you some. I, I don't promise that these are going to come up. I believe these are going to come up. They may get moved around. Some will be added. Some will be taken away. But here's some things I'm thinking about right now. It's a Christian urban legend that forgiving is the same as forgetting. We need to talk about that. Because that affects our understanding of God, and that affects the way that we interact with human beings. And so this is important. It is a Christian urban legend that Christians shouldn't judge. That God won't give me more than I can handle. Stop and think about that one for a second. That God has a blueprint for my life. That God just wants me to be happy. These are Christian urban legends. The Bible has some things to, to tell us, to correct us on these subjects. And by the way, just for fun, if time allows, we might even come back to one of my favorites because it is a Christian urban legend even that everything happens for a reason. I hope that you will be here as we try to contemplate these things and think through them. I hope that we'll be able to engage in scripture together and to find answers that honor God. And as we close today, let's stand together and sing praises to God. above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem great all the whole day through, there's a silver lining that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see, my friend, trust in his promises grand. Sing and you'll be happy today, press along to the goal. Trust in him who leadeth the way, he is keeping your soul. Let the world know where you belong, look to Jesus and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song, sing and be happy today. Oft we we are troubled and tired, sick with sorrow and pain. There are others living in sin, blessed with earthly gain. Take new courage, we cannot tell what the morrow may bring. When the dark clouds vanish away, then your heart truly can sing. Sing and you'll be happy today, press along to the goal. Trust in him who leadeth the way, he is keeping your soul. Let the world know where you belong, look to Jesus and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song, sing and be happy today. Oft we fail to see the rainbow up in heaven's fair sky. When it seems the fortunes of earth frown and pass us by. There are things we know that are worth more than silver and gold. If we hope and trust him each day, we shall have pleasure untold. Sing and you'll be happy today, press along to the goal. Trust in him who leadeth the way, he is keeping your soul. Let the world know where you belong, look to Jesus and pray. Lift your voice and praise me song, sing be happy. Isn't it great to know that our God is the same yesterday as he is today? And guess what? He's the same tomorrow. Praise God. And Jeff, I for one love when you put tons and tons of scripture so that we can look at, read, and meditate on. So thank you for that. Good lesson today. Very good lesson. Looking forward to the Christian urban issues and lessons legends make sure that you grab your bulletin there are a lot of announcements and there's a, a prayer request in there to make sure that you add the prayer request to your daily prayers today is a, a group Sunday day so check with your group leaders to make sure what time and where you're meeting I have been given 
many thank you cards this week from Larry and Yvette Line, Yvonne, uh, Yvonne Line, Yvonne's family, Keith Rossiter, the Hauser family, and the Burgess family. I will put these cards back in the Welcome Center for those that want to look, read, and see what's going on with, with, uh, with the progress of those, of those families. We have uh, Bible classes immediately after Munchkin Ministry here in the sanctuary and in classroom two and three. Uh, they're, they're both good. I've been to both of them. They're both very good. Stacy and John are doing a great job. Let's go to our Father in prayer as we begin our week. Father God, it has been great to be here this morning to listen to the spoken word by your servant, Jeff. Help us, Father, to understand these urban legends, these issues. But Father, help us to always remember that your word, your scripture is solid. It is never, ever changing. I pray, Father, that we as your servants will strive to always take the scripture for what it means and what your intention was. Bless each one of us as we read the scripture and bless each one of us as we apply it to our lives. Watch over us and keep us safe, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.